Mesa. Yes, yes, a Mesa out west. Okay, so uh, a computer can transform table into Mesa, into Tish, or something else. But in order to understand what a table is in terms of the experience of an autonomous actor, you need meaning. Okay, now here's another use of the triangle. At one time, when I was working with von Forster, I said, Heinz, what you're saying sounds an awful lot like what Thomas Kuhn says. And he said, no, 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 it's completely different. I said, all right. <laughs> so for my own purposes, I made a list of what Popper believed, what Kuhn believed, and of the position of constructivist cybernetics, or what von Forster believed. And I had Popper on the left, Kuhn in the middle, and then von Forster on the right, because that was sort of the sequence. But in terms of our triangle, Popper would be number one, von Forster would be number two, and Kuhn would be number three. And if you read down it, uh, it seems to me that this is another interpretation of that epistemological triangle. And if you believe this, it's just a schema, but if you believe this, then that would suggest that von Forster's point of view is as important as Popper's point of view or Kuhn's point of view. But what is well known is Popper and Kuhn, and von Forster's point of view is not so well known. Uh, it's becoming more well known through the work of Luhmann and so forth. But this is one way of saying that uh, this is a point of view that's important and should be paid attention to more. Another way of interpreting von Forster's epistemological triangle is to say that world, as he uses it, is similar to Popper's world one. The observer is similar to Popper's world two. And description is similar to Popper's world three. Now, the, the implication of that, so Karl Popper distinguished world one, two, and three, is that the cyberneticians always felt very uncomfortable with world three, with language or description, because they said, well, anything that's written has to be interpreted by an observer. For example, if I walk into a Chinese library, there's no information there. This is just a lot of funny symbols. I would have to know Chinese, and then there would be a lot of information in the library. The message being that you have symbols and you have the interpretation, and that what's really important is the interpretation by an observer. But Popper would say, but if you don't have the written record, <laughs> there's nothing to interpret. And the cyberneticians were always uncomfortable with that. They thought Popper gave too much credence to world three as the, the written record of scientific observations. But if you pay attention to von Forster's triangle, then you would come to the conclusion that descriptions or language or world three are equally important or at least have great importance in that network of world description and observer. So I would simply state as a caution that ideas can be plausibly mapped into a triangle carries no meaning per se. However, an arrangement in the form of a diagram may reveal connections or missing pieces that had not been apparent before. And that's, so in a sense, this triangle has reorganized my previous conceptions somewhat. And a graphical representation is a heuristic advice, device. It's a model. It's something to test and play around with. So what we have here, I think, is a theory of epistemologies. Now let me explain what I mean by this. One way of describing the third step in cybernetics, social cybernetics, is to call it the cybernetics of conceptual systems. That is, in the early days of system science, you developed transportation systems, communication systems, education systems, healthcare systems, and pretty soon you began to notice similarities among the systems. Well, then you could postulate general theories of systems. Well, your theories are guided by epistemology or a philosophy of science, which tells you how to construct theories. 
But then you end up with two epistemologies, the classical or conventional epistemology and the epistemology that results when you apply that initial conception of science to the human nervous system. See, what happened was you took the classical philosophy of science, used it to study the nervous system, and came to the conclusion that you had to reject one of the underlying assumptions in the classical philosophy of science, which was that you could exclude the observer. So then you end up with two epistemologies. Well, how do you reconcile these? Well, you develop a theory of epistemologies. So it, you get levels and levels and levels of abstraction, as uh, Gary Metcalf, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, said, uh, it's turtles all the way down. Do you all know this story? No? OK, well, there was a, in Asia, there was a, a great teacher. And he's explaining the theory of the universe to his students. And he says, the Earth rests upon the back of the great elephant. Is that very good? One of the students says, it's very interesting. What is the elephant standing on? And he says, well, the elephant is standing on the back of a great turtle. The student thinks about that for a while and says, what is the turtle standing on? And the teacher says, very clever, but it won't work. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so in this sense, you have conceptualizations of conceptualizations of conceptualizations of conceptualizations, which may or may not be terribly useful. Personally, I think they're useful and interesting. And they tell us how to construct science, how science changes, how science evolves, how to test science, and how to put the pieces together so you get new scientific theories. For example, one further implication, and then I'll wrap it up and take a few questions, is uh, I once made the distinction between science one and science two. Where science one is the creation of theories and the testing of theories. But lots of times, you don't need a theory. All you need is a method of how to act. Like, how do you do something? How do you build a chair? Well, you do this, 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 this. It's a more instrumental kind of an activity. And you can learn how to do something, reflect on how you did it, create a description of how you did it, fine tune how you do it, publish the results, teach the results. You're teaching a method. Now, that's not a theory. It's just a procedure. But a lot of what we know about the world is, I think, expressed in, in methods rather than theories. And there is now a very famous book, at least in Europe, called The New, Con the New Construction of Knowledge, The New Form of Knowledge, The New Type of Knowledge. The New Production of Knowledge. That's it, The New Production of Knowledge. And in that book, they make a distinction between mode one and mode two knowledge, where mode one knowledge is theoretical knowledge, academic knowledge, and mode two knowledge is more um, manufacturing processes. It's been very, very popular in Europe, and it's almost unknown in the United States. Why? This goes back to the issue that theories are culture dependent. In the United States, we have many business schools. Europe has only a few business schools, but the number is growing. Why? Well, business knowledge was not considered to be academically respectable because there wasn't much theory. It was highly interdisciplinary, and it was mostly procedure oriented. So people said, no, we don't want that. We don't want that kind of activity at our university because it's not theoretical knowledge. Well, over time, the Europeans came to the conclusion that it may not be theoretical, but it's useful. And if the United States is prospering and Europe is stagnating, maybe we need some more of that practical knowledge. But they couldn't adopt practical knowledge without a theory of why they need practical knowledge. 
So the book, The New Production of Knowledge, is a theory that explains why practical knowledge is legitimate. And hence, it's been very influential in Europe and hasn't been widely remarked upon in the United States. Well, that's my explanation for an observed phenomenon that the book sells better in Europe than in the US. But that's going back, that's another instance of this difference between theoretical knowledge and methodological knowledge. Not the methodology of constructing theories, but the methodology of how to do things. However, this triangle has caused me to believe that if there's an epistemological triangle, maybe I need to come up with a third element, not just science one and science two, but science three, or something like that. So that's the next thing to think about. So there's the little triangle. So summarizing our discussion of cybernetics, there have been three stages in the development, engineering cybernetics, biological cybernetics, and the cybernetics of social systems. Uh, it's affected the fields of computer science, robotics, management, family therapy, epistemology, and economics and political science. And some of the theoretical issues that have been dealt with is what is the nature of information, what is the nature of knowledge, adaptation, learning, self-organization, cognition, autonomy, and understanding itself. And the cyberneticians have created theories of those uh, which have affected other fields. And then I threw in some references. <laughs>